Hallelujah. Well, I'm honored to be here today, and I feel like uh, I'm in the right place at the right time with you. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Well, um, as Pastor said, uh, my name is David Martin, and I come from Tulsa, Oklahoma. <clears throat> I moved there in 1982 from Wisconsin to go to Bible school. I thought I would be there just two years and then go back, but I'm still there. And my very first stop, I stopped at a little uh, service station asking the lady for directions. And she looked at me with these great big eyes, and she said, Slow down, boy, my ears can't hear that fast. <laughs> oh, God, where am I? But anyway, uh, <clears throat> 1984, oh, actually since 1978, uh, when God called me into the kingdom, he gave me a primary mission, commission, if you will, to study the supernatural. So that's my focus. Maybe you've seen me on Sid Roth, It's Supernatural. I've been on the TV uh, with Sid a couple different times. I travel with him a little bit. Been his conference speaker in Israel. But my primary focus of teaching is uh, operating in the supernatural. Jesus said in John 14, Verse 12, he that believeth in me will do what I do and even greater. I believe that God meant what he said. How about you? Yeah, yeah. Amen. And uh, we're a believer's meeting usually on Sunday morning. That means that scripture was written to all of us as believers. And every sign, every wonder, every miracle that Jesus did, we're called to do it. And uh, my job... Um, or my appointment has been, how did Jesus do what Jesus did? How do miracles happen? How do we replicate? How do we walk in this that he, he, he demonstrated? A couple of years ago, God kind of dropped a neat little uh, nugget in my heart. And he said, well, if you want to do what Jesus did, do what Jesus did. <laughs> and when we look at what Jesus did, he demonstrated a life a prayer, fasting, and self-denial. Gave himself for the cause of the kingdom of God. And I believe that's what God will have us to do as well. <clears throat> as I've traveled the world, um, six countries last year, and, uh, just primarily teaching, I used to do crusades uh, more so. This is something very exciting, about 10, 20, 30,000 people at a time ministering to them and, and uh, watching God do signs, wonders, miracles. But I recognized uh, probably 10, 15 years ago from a business perspective, of course, you have to do whatever God tells you to do, but I'm big on, uh, on return on investment and investing where God wants me to invest of my time and energies and the anointing. And I recognize that... Uh, Seeing 10,000, 20,000, I've had as many as 40,000 people at one time getting touched by the anointing is good. But what really makes a difference is when a life gets changed because they're discipled. And so often in crusades, you can't really do that. So what we focus on more than anything is uh, training pastors. And um, I'm going to uh, Sri Lanka here in a couple of months and literally bringing uh, probably 90% of the pastors in Sri Lanka together in three or four different uh, conferences, training them how to walk in the supernatural. But here, um, two weeks ago, I don't, three, probably three weeks ago, I'm looking for Joyce. Are you here, Joyce? She's not in the lobby. But uh, Joyce um, is a partner of ours. And uh, she asked me about a month ago, six weeks ago, if I would consider coming to this area to bring the revelation of what God's given me on the supernatural. And it just, mm, yes, it's right in my heart. So here we are. And uh, as I prayed about uh, this area, I really have a tremendous sense God is about to do something like we've never, ever seen before, ever. Hallelujah. 
I've, I've been teaching for a long time that the God is raising up a remnant and uh, the remnant of God is going to walk in a level of glory and power and, and uh, miracles that is going to really help to wake up the rest of the kingdom of God. And I really feel like I'm in one of those uh, remnant churches that really has got the fire, got the revelation. And uh, so I'm excited about being here with you today. A couple of different things I'm going to share with you uh, as God leads. And uh, uh, playing behind me is Mary Berlin. Sometimes people thinks, thinks that's a good word, thinks, uh, that she's my wife, but she's not. I, I have a wonderful wife. I love my wife. She's at home taking care of our children, uh, which are pretty well grown, but the grandkids actually right now. But uh, uh, Mary comes from Las Vegas, Nevada. Mary uh, was on my staff, uh, gosh, in the early 90s. We traveled the world together and uh, recognized that there are multiple anointings that you can bring to a setting. And we, we see in the Bible that uh, a psalmist has a very special anointing. And we can see in, in, uh, in Kings, when uh, three kings went to war, they brought Jehoshaphat in, and uh, he needed a word from God. And he said, bring a minstrel, a psalmist. And when the psalmist came in, God spoke and miracles happened. So there, there's a level of anointing on what I have, what God's given me. There's obviously an incredible anointing on the Word of God. And then there's an anointing on Mary as a psalmist. So in the early 90s, we, we, we developed this kind of a working together, merging the anointings, and it, it really worked very powerfully. And uh, then she went off and got married. And that, that came to an end about 1999. And uh, got up on the door here just recently and uh, for her to uh, be able to do a little bit of traveling. So this is really, uh, this week, uh, it's the first time we've done this in 16 years. And uh, so, anyway, it's Mary Berlin on the, on the piano. We, we need to bring it down a little bit, so a little less piano, but we could. Hallelujah. Pastor asked me, the other night he said, if you had one message to give, what would it be? If you had one, one message from all the things you have, what would it be? And that's just been kind of resonating in my mind ever since you asked me that the other night. And uh, I, I, I don't know what that is, but I got some concepts. But as I prayed about it, and I thought, well, God, maybe that's what I should teach that one thing today. But as I've studied the supernatural for 35 years, he, God dropped into my heart in 1998 a message that I want to touch on today, which probably is as close as we're going to get to one key message. And the, the message he gave me was the five keys to the supernatural. And I could teach for literally days, share experiences, visions, revelations on each one of these keys, but I'm just going to breeze over them kind of quickly because that's one of three things I think God wants to do today. So I'm going to cover that base pastor mentioned there's a few folks here that could probably use a miracle uh, God it uses me tremendously in miracles I've been on front pages of newspapers all over the world because of the, the miracles that happen in our meetings reporters not understanding the things of God so often say things like miracle worker faith healer stuff like that but that's totally untrue I'm just an ordinary man serving an extraordinary God. And my heart, more than anything else, is to teach people, to disciple people in the miracle power of God. And it's not hard. It's not supposed to be hard. We've, 
I appreciated something their brother was saying up here receiving the offering about not being religious because religion has so messed up the kingdom of God. Some years ago when my son, he's, he's now in college, um, in his third year of Or Roberts University, but when he was four years old, he had a favorite little toy, it was a plastic gun. And it was just a, a party favor, you know, a, a toy that cost a quarter. But it became his favorite toy. And he, uh, at four, he couldn't say his G's very good. So instead of saying gun, it was his gun. But he, he'd stick this little plastic gun in his uh, waistband and walk around the house, Mr. Cool. And uh, got my gun, Dad, got my gun. He was just, it was his toy. One day coming home from the office, I was uh, pulling in and he was standing in the, in the garage. Big smile, Dad's home. And uh, as I'm pulling into the driveway, his big ear-to-ear -ear grin turned into a frown. And then I could see the lip begin to quiver. Big tear welled up in his eye, began to drip down his cheek. I thought, oh my God, what happened? I, I didn't know. And uh, it all happened in just you know, 10 seconds. And I, I get out of the car and I look down to the ground because he's looking at the ground. And what I did is I drove over his gun. I pulverized it. In, in the Bible, it says the anointing destroys the yoke. And Dad just destroyed the gun. <laughs> but the word, sometimes we, people translate that verse, the anointing breaks the yoke. But really, the break isn't the right uh, definition of that Hebrew word because something broken could be fixed. And the word in Hebrew literally means the anointing pulverizes the yoke, annihilates it. That's actually what it says. The anointing annihilates the yoke. Well, I just annihilated it, it's done. And he's, he's looking at this crushed toy quivering lip tears running down his face now and he looks up with looks up to me with a simple childlike faith and he said that's okay dad you can fix it <laughs> I, I didn't have the heart to tell him I couldn't so I said after supper son let's go eat and then while he was finishing eating I ran to the store and got a new one <laughs> He never could understand how it went from green to orange, but that's okay. Just a little added value. <laughs> and four, he was happy with that. But the point is, our dad can fix anything. And whatever, whatever's broken, whatever's broken, whatever's hurting, whatever's not right, our dad is able to fix anything he's unlimited in ability and sometimes we uh, we make it more complex i think than it needs to be and i love the simplicity of of the anointing and the uh, the peace in power and i'm i'm, I'm just going to test the waters here this just to, to show you for this, I need somebody that has serious, serious pain in your body. Somebody qualify? Somebody have serious, serious pain in your body? Somebody's pointing over here. Okay. All right, we're we'll just come and stand right down here. Now, here's the here's the simple question: Where was it? Where was the pain? In your leg, right leg. And it's there right now. How long was it there? A year, okay. Now I need someone to stand behind him if I could, just in case he falls over. Sometimes people ask me, well, why do people fall over? I have a very simple answer. They can't stand up.
somebody say one time, you know, they're just falling over in the flesh. And I, I don't think so. I was in a church in California, a big prayer line, and a lady was up there with a, a seen eye dog, and I walked by the dog, and the dog fell over. <laughs> the, 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 the ushers thought the dog died. I mean, they picked it up, fell back down, picked it up, fell back down. The lady got healed, and she let the dog out. And he was still drunk, by the way. Okay. Now, brother, I want you to close your eyes. I like people to close their eyes so they don't know when I slap them. <laughs> Haven't slapped anybody yet. But seriously, all I want you to do is say goodbye, pain, and I'm going to release the anointing. Your leg's going to be healed and never bother you again. In Jesus' name. So say goodbye, pain. There it is, right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, your miracle healing power. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, it will never bother him again. In Jesus' name. That's it. Okay. Check it. What does all that mean? Is there any pain there? Not currently. <laughs> but it was there. Try, try steps. Try, try to make it hurt. How are we doing? Healed? No pain? To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Now, what I most love to do is teach people how to do that. Because it's not about me. It's not about pastor. It's about an almighty God that's able to do exceedingly abundantly, above and beyond all we could ask, think, or imagine. And all we have to do is believe. That's it. Now, I understand there's other parts and pieces with anointings and stuff like that. But I promise you, every one of you can do what you just saw God do. Because I'm not a healer. Jesus is the healer. And he works through people. And uh, it's pretty simple, really. So anyway, we're, we'll, we'll have some more of that. I and mean, that's one of the things I want to do today is pray for people that need healing. And then another thing I want to do today that is really, uh, really significant. And to tell you, to, 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 this is a whole message in itself, and I don't have time for this. But I want to, I want to pray for an impartation of anointing to you. Paul said in Romans 1:11 that he was anxious to come to Rome, that he might impart a spiritual gift, that they would be established. And that's one of the things I want to do. So we got a full plate. I asked the pastor, when, uh, how long shall I go? When, when, when should the meeting be over? And uh, he didn't give me a real good answer. What he said is, what he says is, if you're done before he's done, go ahead and leave. <laughs> so. I'm going to try to keep this inside of an hour. Um, so let's just see where we go. The uh, impartation I want to give you it was featured on Sid Roth uh, about four years ago. And then it was actually featured again a year ago. A little different aspect of it. But I'll come back to that. And... Uh, just before we do it, just give me kind of the headline of it. And, and we'll close with that. But 
I can promise you it is an incredible anointing. But let me first just kind of go over this first part of the five keys to the supernatural. And again, this is really, uh, after 20 years of study, God gave me this message on Mother's Day, 1998. Key number one is sensitivity. Again, let me kind of preface, I call this five keys to the supernatural. If, if you want to do what Jesus did, these are the five keys. If you want to walk in a greater measure of the glory and the power of God, these are the five keys. These are the five keys that really walk in whatever God has for you. Key number one, sensitivity. Now, in order to be sensitive, you need to sensitize. And my experience has been the greatest way to sensitize is through prayer, fasting, and self-denial. Now, as I mentioned, we're, we're coming into something unlike anything the world has ever seen. I, I don't see it as a revival. What God shows me this is going to be is an awakening. It's, it's going to be the, the church rising from its sleepy complacency and going from a place of playing church to being the church. And I know as I'm here, I'm speaking to the cream of the crop and you're ready to pop. <laughs> I mean, this thing's ready to happen because it's prime here. I mean, you are the remnant. So I'm kind of just adding some frosting onto the cake here. But I think we all have room for improvement. So let me show you something. Uh, Mark 1. We see what we're believing for in the way of a revival happening in Mark 1. And I, as we turn there, let me tell you a key too. That's obedience. We see these two keys together in the very first miracle of Cana of Galilee where Jesus turned the water into wine. And Mary wanted Jesus to do this miracle and Jesus says no. So Mary said to the servants, whatever he says, do it. Whatever he says, do it. That's sensitivity and obedience. See this phrase, uh, just do it. Nike didn't originate that, Jesus did. <laughs> or actually Mary did. <laughs> Here in Mark 1, we see these two keys playing out in a very unique way. And as I look at this, traveling the world as I do, I, I wish I had a, a greater level of confidence in the, the leadership of most churches that they would follow this example. But unfortunately, what happens, and I'm, I'm saying this as an exhortation to all of us, particularly as we're coming into something like we've never seen before, one of the cautions we have to keep in mind is Proverbs 3, 5, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him and he will direct your path. As we're coming into this, God's going to be leading us, directing us, having us do some things that really may not make any sense. You're going to be challenged. 
Elsri uh, reminded of us today as we were driving here and, and I was reflecting on uh, a dream that was given to me in Toronto in 1994 and it was actually John Wimber's dream and in this dream I mean the person came to me and said this is for you but in this dream God said to climb high up on this diving platform and from a very high place then go out to the edge and then from the very edge of the diving platform, God said, jump. But in looking down, there was no water. I mean, there should have been, but there wasn't any. And God said, jump. But there's no water, God. And God said, by the time you get there, there will be. Now, if God puts you in a place like that, you need to be willing to lean not on your own understanding. But you also you need to make sure you heard the voice of God. <laughs> or you're going to make a mess. <laughs> so it's important that we have this sensitivity that we're not fooled by the enemy. But God will bring us to places like that. Now, here in Mark 1, we see kind of a place like that in the ministry of Jesus. And what's happening is Peter's mother-in-law is very sick, deathly sick. Some people say she actually had a, the plague. Jesus goes to minister to her. And this is what's going to happen. And let me, let me kind of sidestep here for a little bit and go to the end of the message. I'm just gonna kind of put pieces together as I, they come together here. Because I want, I want to paint a picture to you what I believe this awakening will look like. Because this move of God, in my opinion, is not gonna happen in the church. The church is gonna be where people are gonna gather, and they're gonna be discipled, and a lot of wonderful things are gonna happen here. You won't be able to fit all the people in, but where the real awakening is going to happen, first and foremost, is in your heart. And what's going to happen is the light of God in you is going to begin to convict people. It's going to draw people. And there was a great awakening that happened in the 1800s, and Charles Finney really demonstrated this so well. All he had to do was walk into the building and everyone in the building would literally come under this incredible conviction because of the presence of God. And this is what I see coming. And when, you, when, you, when we get to the end and we do the impartation, the impartation coming to you was given to me in Africa where one of the greatest revivals ever on planet Earth happened where people were shining. They were radiating the glory of God. And the very pastor of that revival from the 30s gave me that impartation. And, and we'll come back to that. But I had a man on my staff some years ago uh, from Oklahoma come to Pennsylvania where he was living for Christmas. And this happened in Pennsylvania and he brought back the testimony but uh, a lady in his church was telling the story how she was in the market in in the produce area and she had a tomato in her hand and as she's holding the tomato this girl comes up and says to her how do you do that and she's looking at the tomato and she says well i i, I squeeze it to see if it's fresh or firm or mushy or whatever. And the girl says, oh, no, no, no. How do you shine? And the lady said, well, that's Jesus. And the little girl says, mom's got to see this deal. And she goes and gets mom, drags mom over to the produce area. You know, kids get us where we don't always plan to go. 
That's how McDonald's has made a fortune. <laughs> but now mom and daughter now are in the produce area with the lady with a tomato, and I'm not sure, sure she still had the tomato, but she's imposing herself on this lady now, and she's embarrassed, but you know, her daughter's did it, done it, whatever. And, and she says, my daughter said I had to see this lady that was shining. And she said, you are, your countenance is so bright. And the lady said again, well, that's, that's Jesus. And here's, here's what's key. Because you're a spirit-filled church, each one of you have the gifts of the spirit. Those gifts of the Spirit are looking for a place and opportunity to be used. And praise God, you know, they happen in church frequently. But what God is wanting is for them to happen where you work. He wants these gifts to happen, you know, in your job and, and to solve problems, to minister. He wants them to happen while you're cutting your grass and your neighbor waves at you and all of a sudden, whoa, what was that? <laughs> or while you're at Walmart, like this lady in the produce area, or you're just putting gas in your car. These operations of the gifts are going to become very, very, very much a natural part of your day. I guarantee that's what we're coming into. And in that combined with the, the, the awakening that's happening, what God is doing, this is not a real popular message, but what God is, is doing is, is bringing us to a higher level of holiness. And I know that's not a popular message, and your flesh says, okay, I heard enough already now. <laughs> but the reality is, we're commanded to be holy. And... A key here in this, if you really want to walk in the glory, and I know you do, if you really want to walk in the fullness of what God has, and I know you do, or I wouldn't be here, you have to do something. It's a very simple something. It's a three-letter word. Die. It's that simple. Just die. Heard, heard recently, a um, few people know this, but the, uh, when Jesus was crucified, two people were crucified with him. One was the thief. Few people know the other person was the Apostle Paul's father. You say, how would you know that? Well, the Bible says, Paul said, my old man was crucified with Christ. Seriously, most of the body of Christ is operating in, in what I call identity theft because we haven't really understood what that means to be crucified with Christ. And what's happening is we're, we're, we're still living according to the old man instead of the new man. If somebody wanted to um, be a thief, one of the things that they do as con artists is go to a grave, a cemetery in a town, and find someone that's kind of fresh dead that was born the same time they were born or similar. And with the name, you now go to the clerk of records and with a little bit of... Uh, savviness you can get a birth certificate and then you can get a driver's license and you can literally take on the identity of somebody else but no matter how much you take on that person's identity no matter how much you learn and study that's not you you're, you're living a lie 
And this is exactly what's happened in the kingdom of God because when you accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, your old man was crucified. It's no longer I that liveth. But we continue to live according to the old way. And that man's dead, or that woman's dead as it would be. People say, I want more God. I'm not sure you can get more God. When Christ came in you, he didn't come in part. You didn't just get the hand. You're complete, amen. Everything you need is in you. John really hit the nail on the head, per se, in John 3.30. He said, I must decrease so he can increase. And here's the basic concept. If you take a 100-watt light bulb and you put a shade, a black shade, over that 100-watt light bulb, how much light are you going to see? Virtually none. If I take that shade and I start poking some holes in it, make it a little holy, the light's going to start to come out. The more holes I poke in it, the more light's going to show. The light bulb never changed. The light never changed. What changed was the shade. See, your body, your life is the shade. And the more we die, the more the light shows. And that's where God's bringing us to where it's no longer we that live because whether we want to admit it or not, we're doing a whole bunch more of this living according to what we want than what God wants. And if, if I'm stepping on your toes, it's on purpose. <laughs> Haven't received my offering yet, so I got the most to lose. But I know God has set the stage in this, in this area. I know when I landed here last Saturday, I know that I know that there's something happening here. I, I'm not here, and, and I'm not saying this to make me special because it's not about me, but God brings in what, what resources are needed to accomplish his will. And I'm, I, I'm here for that purpose to bring something to add value of, of sort to help you be established because God is going to do something like you've never ever imagined but we have to get with the plan the program and it's going to require some sacrifice find mark one yet <laughs> oh I didn't finish I want to finish the tomato story first so this lady imposes upon this lady, and the lady that's shining, and it's just a matter of a bright countenance. Sometimes we get the wrong concept of shining, you know, as if we're going to blind people, and I think that's going to happen ultimately, but it's going to be a gradual process. But she had a bright countenance, but when this lady said something to her, this is the key. God used her with a word of knowledge. And the word of knowledge that God gave her is this woman was an abused housewife, and because of the abuse, she had a lump on her chest that could be felt. God revealed that to her, word of knowledge. And then she asked the lady, can I pray for you? And she prayed right there with the tomatoes and the squash and the vegetables and the lady was instantly healed. The lump was gone. She then led her to the Lord. She got saved. And then as she was you know, praying with her, God gave her another word and said, God just shows me your husband will never beat you again. Well, to make a long, longer story short, the lady ended up coming to one of my staff's church the following Sunday with her husband and he got saved. That's 
what this is going to look like. God working through ordinary people that are just up and unavailable to operating with the gifts and the callings of God wherever you are. And I think the, the added factor is going to be this, what I call death to self. If you look at the transfiguration, which is the, the greatest example of shining, it says there in Matthew 17, I'm not going to turn to the same time, but it says there in Matthew 17, it says, after six days, Peter took Peter, James, and John to a high mountain apart, and there he was transfigured. Well, what happened six days earlier? That's where he makes a declaration, I'm going to build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail. I'm going to lay my life down, and I'm going to pick it up again. And if any man will be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up the cross, and follow me. That's the key to shining, death to self, taking the cross. The word cross is the word staros. In Greek, it means a place on which one dies. And I can uh, assure you the cross of God's design is usually different than the one you would like. Having been at this 35 years, I can tell you in being transparent in front of you, I don't like my cross. I'd rather be home with my family. I've missed so many birthdays, so many anniversaries, so many graduations, so many, so many. Doing 250 meetings a year, you don't get home much. My wife would rather I didn't go to all these war zones around the world people get killed around me. We were the first ministry ever given permission by United Nations to do crusades right in UN territory where people were dying one per minute. Cholera, dysentery, malaria, machete wounds. One camp we went into, they started storming our team. We, we got out with God's grace. Next day, another team went in. All 100 were killed. People say, aren't you afraid going to places like that? No. I'm safer there in the will of God than you are getting your mail outside the will of God. But, you know, it, it, it's hard on a wife to send your husband places like this. And then being gone, I mean, so much. And I'm not saying this because I want sympathy because I don't need it. I got something better. It's called grace. I don't feel bad not liking my cross because Jesus didn't like his either. The night before, he begged God, pleaded with God. God, if there's any other way, God, please take this cup from me. I don't want to do it. But the key phrase, nevertheless, not my will. Your will be done. And that's what God's looking for. Willing and obedience. Here in, in Mark 1, Jesus is coming to minister to Peter's mother-in-law. And what happens here is exactly what's going to happen in your backyard. This is exactly what's going to happen where you work. This is how this revival is going to play out. Watch. And forthwith, wait, now where are we here? Yeah, verse 29. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever and anon they tell him of her. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. Now, I want you to notice how many people were involved here in this ministry 
as far as people minister to one Jesus went to minister to one person but what's going to happen is when you start demonstrating just like you saw me demonstrate here the simplicity of the healing power of God one neighbor is going to tell another neighbor one co-worker is going to tell another co-worker one lady shopping is going to see it and want her opportunity it's, 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 it's catchy because people are looking for the real deal they're looking for the real thing but what happens is neighbors start coming to this house a lot of them verse 32 and it says and that evening when the sun did set they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils and it says all the city was gathered together at the door and he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him so what we see here is the meeting grew pretty large and it says city I'm, I'm sure it was a more like a hamlet and you know we're probably talking hundreds of people but the point is the meeting didn't start until the sun went down and he ministered to a lot of people which tells me he didn't get much sleep because of what happens next in the next verse it says verse 35 and in the morning rising up a great while before day he went out departed into a solitary place and there prayed now what's happening here is so important because in this arena of sensitivity and obedience we need to know what God is saying we every day you need to know what is the plan for today and one of the things I encourage people to start doing is incorporate this little phrase into your prayer give me a divine appointment and if you begin asking God for a divine appointment every day you will be amazed how God will go out of his way to redirect your path and other people's paths so you have someone to minister to well Jesus got up a great while before day he tells again he didn't sleep much because went to bed late got up a great while before day went to went out there and prayed now it's exciting verse 36 and Simon and they that were with him followed after him and when they had found him they said unto him all men seek for thee the meeting just exploded we went from the city to all men and essentially all the neighborhoods around all the camlets around all the villages around all the communities heard what was happening here at Peter's mother-in-law's house so people are coming from everywhere all men seek the so we're talking a large multitude of people now logic would say this is what we believe for logic would would approach this with okay now let's let's make a plan you know how we're gonna take care of all these people right wouldn't you agree <laughs> this is a good thing and it is a good thing but what happens is not normal it defies logic what happens doesn't fit into your understanding nor mine what happens verse 38 he said unto them let us go to the next town that I may preach there also for therefore came I forth he walks away from all this revival all this all these people he walks away that's not logical 
and it falls into something that I think is so critically important for us to, to keep in mind, and that is discerning the difference between calling and need. And in the day that we're coming into, needs are going to be overwhelming because things are going to fall apart in many different fronts. And you have what they all need. And it's going to be very, very, very critical for you when there's 10 people that want you at the same time. Do I go to one of those 10 or do I go to the next town? And that's the difference between calling, what is God saying, and what are the people saying? The people are saying, we need you. And they, they certainly did, but that wasn't Jesus' call for the day. So again, classic example, sensitivity and obedience. Okay, key number three is humility. And humil humility is important for so many different reasons. The meek will inherit the earth. Jesus says, the word says, he resists the proud, but he gives more grace to the humble. And I want to focus on this because this is what's so important for us, where we're, what we're coming into. Because as things fall apart in the world, you are going to need to depend upon God more. And you're going to need to have more of his provision, if you will, more of his protection. And I call that divine intervention. And that's what grace is. Grace is God's ability to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. God can open a door no one can close. God can close a door no one can open. God can make a door where there is no door. He's a way maker. And more than ever, we're going to need that. We're going to need that favor of God. So how do we get more? Praise God for the grace we have. But if we want more, how do we get more? Well, the Bible tells us we can have more through humility. We can also have more through key four, which is knowledge. Uh, 2 Peter 1, 2 says grace and peace are multiplied through knowledge. Humility, though, is being open to correction, open to instruction. Humility is recognizing you desperately need God. You only have a breath right now because he's given you a breath for this moment. You only have a day because he gave it to you. So humility puts a, uh, a demand of sort on God because you recognize, I need God. You're nothing in self. You're everything with him. But another important part of, of humility that's going to be critical in what we're coming into as God begins to work with you in ways you've not yet seen, with signs, wonders, and miracles, you're going to need to be very, very careful that you don't touch the glory. Because it'll be very easy for you to think you had something to do with that miracle. You had something to do with that healing. And you do because you're available, but it only happens because of God. So humility becomes very important that you, you, you don't touch the glory. It, it, it happens because of God. He's the miracle worker. You're, you're the donkey. Key number three, again, humility. Key number four is knowledge. My people perish for lack of it. We need to know God's nature. We need to know his character. We need to know his ways. All that comes through knowledge. Right now, in a very exciting things that are happening, 
is God is giving revelation we've never had before in how to function and operate in the realm of the Spirit. I, I liken it unto uh, Wilbur and Orville Wright in 1907. They discovered how, how to fly. Now, the laws that allow man to fly, the law of lift, has always been here it, since creation. That, that law of physics was always here, but man didn't discover it until 1907, which allowed him to go to new heights. Well, the same way God is giving us wisdom and revelation in, in epigenetics and, and quantum physics and microbiology, understanding how things work in the unseen world, revelation is happening now that we can add our faith to the truth of, of how God operates to, to reach new levels never before visited. I mean, as an example, you know, we know now from micro, micro, microbiology how intercellular communication works. And we, we know now from uh, places like Heart Math Institute how the, the, strongest, the strongest emotion that you're ever going to have is that of compassion. And compassion, the frequencies of compassion in the heart have the propensity of changing your DNA literally flipping on switches so you know if we learn how to apply our faith to walk in more compassion we're, we're going to have longer life we're going to have more more good health which brings me to the fourth the fifth key which is motivation why do you want the supernatural why do you want the glory why do you want the power and the motivation of heaven is compassion. I think it's so interesting that science has now just recently documented that compassion is the strongest heart frequency that has a propensity of, of literally affecting your DNA and other people's DNA. I mean, it's called, uh, as an example, if you walk into a room and there's three or four people in there that are having a bad day and you walk in and everything all of a sudden now is hushed because you walked in, you know, but you can feel the tension in the air, right? What, what, what are you doing? What, what, what are you picking up on? Vibes, right? Well, what is a vibe? That's short for vibration. In your heart, is a, a seven layer liquid crystal oscillator that has sends frequencies literally to every cell in your body and around the world every time your thump thump happens in your heart you're broadcasting information that's affecting other people and we have the ability now by understanding science how to apply our faith to affect the world in a more positive way incredible Again, you know, God's bringing us to a higher level. I want to just touch on this uh, fifth key. We're going to pray and see what else God wants to do here. If you saw my last Sid Roth show, it came out actually last September. They did a pretty good job of reenacting this story. But these five keys, God has taught me this over a lifetime of experience and study. And I want to just share a testimony with you. I could share a hundred in the same arena, at least. But I want to share one testimony with you where I really learned the supernatural attribute or value of compassion and it happened in 1983 Christmas Eve it was on, on record the coldest day in history in the Midwest in Tulsa Oklahoma it was like 15 20 below zero and our plan 
was, I'm in Bible school, and our plan was to go home for Christmas. But they're saying, don't go outside, don't drive, because it's too cold. Cars don't do well in this cold weather. And where I lived, Tulsa, Oklahoma, is 15, 20 below zero. In Illinois, it was like 40 to 50 below zero. Wind chill, 70 to 90 below. And we have, we're, all, we're all pumped up for going home. It was especially wonderful because my wife was six months pregnant with our first child. And this, the idea of going home and grandma seeing the big belly was special. <laughs> but it was our first Christmas home from being gone too. So my wife said to me, what are we going to do? The, the, the news says, don't go outside, don't drive. I said, we're gonna go. I'm a man of faith. And we'll believe, we'll, we'll be fine. Now, I'll tell you ahead of time, I wasn't operating in faith. I was operating in what you would call foolishness, presumption, and pride. But I put my wife and our two dogs in the car, little four-door Subaru, and we started on our journey. Four o'clock in the morning, it's gonna be a 13 or 14 hour ride. So we'd be there in time for Christmas Eve service. Got through central Illinois, and there's no cars on the highway. I mean, no one else was as stupid as me. There's no cars, no traffic. And this is before you have cell phones, 1983. Our car stopped running. I'm on the side of the road, get out of the car. And the car never really got very warm because it was so cold. But I got out of the car, opened up the hood, and um, took the carburetor, I mean the air cleaner off, I'm not sure why, it wasn't gonna do anything, but it, I took it off so I could pray. Somehow my prayer was gonna work better with the air cleaner off, I'm not sure why. But I prayed a good prayer. Now my, I went to Raymond Bible Training Center, Kenneth Hagen was my instructor, one of the greatest teachers of faith. He would have been so proud of my prayer uh, it was a word-rich, faith-filled, you know, miracle prayer. I was even proud of it. That was really good, David. While well, I'm shivering, and I get in the car, and the car starts right up. But it only ran for a minute. And what happened is, in the time that we were stopped, the heat of the engine had enough uh, heat to melt a little bit of the gas that was frozen in the gas line, so we ran for just a little bit. We're now, I'm gonna say 10 to 20 minutes away from death. Because when it's that cold and we're shivering, it's 40, 50 below zero without the wind. Things freeze pretty quick. I'll never forget the look on my wife's face when I, when it stopped and we knew we were in serious, serious problems. And the look she had on her face was, we're, we're gonna die, aren't we?
It was a horrible look of fear. I didn't say anything. I just got out of the car. Did the same thing all over again. But it was very different this time. Because I realized my foolishness, my pride. Putting my family in danger because I was a man of faith. And I wasn't, I was a man of stupidity. But with the hood up, I couldn't see my wife, but all I could see was my wife. And it was then. Compassion hit me. Compassion, defined by the dictionary, is the awareness of the suffering of another and a willingness to do something about it. But what can I do? The only thing I could do was repent. And I did. But I can tell you it was the uh, compassion for my wife, an unborn daughter, that fueled the prayer. I shut the hood, shivering, frozen, got in the car. She's shivering. And the car started. And we drove all the way. That was a bona fide miracle. Absolutely no way that could have happened outside of a miracle. God thawed that, lot, that gas line out and kept it that way. What I've seen over the course of time, 35 years now, is when people start to care more about other people than themselves is when the supernatural really begins to happen. So often in, in, in prayer, somehow or another, we, we, you know, we look at it as, you know, if this person gets healed, I'm going to look good. If lots of things happen, we get more people in church. We, we have to approach our lives, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, when there's people living next to you, people you work with, family, that are going to hell. And until we get an awareness of that reality and we are motivated to do something about it, that's what God did. <laughs> he saw a hopeless position humanity was in. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That's compassion. Aren't you glad he had compassion? And I can promise you, there's going to be people that will greet you in heaven, neighbors and co-workers, family, people, strangers, that are going to say thank you that you reached out to me. Thank you for caring. And every time you go to the store, every time you go anywhere, if you can begin to stir up this compassion, the, the floodgates of the glory are going to be there, I promise you. I've seen it over and over and over and over again. When I do little demonstrations like I did up here, this is the start of the meeting, 
one of the things I purpose to do is stir up compassion. This person is hurting. This person is suffering. And I can make a difference because of Christ in me. It's not about me looking good. It's about this person being healed. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege you've given me to speak your word. I thank you, Lord God, for, for just working as only you can work by the power of your spirit to bring us to a place of dying to ourself so that we can be better used in your kingdom. Father, I, I pray that even before we leave here today, there's people in the sanctuary right here, right now, that could use a word of encouragement. There's people in the sanctuary that are hurting. Father, don't let us leave and pass an opportunity that you might have for us. And Father, as we go through the day and the week and the weeks to come, let us be mindful that every day is an opportunity to be used in your kingdom and, and that, Father God, that we would have more concern about what's important to you. Father, let this just kind of resonate in our hearts. Uh, amen. I want to kind of switch gears and I'm going to uh, give you a real quick overview of an impartation I want to leave with you. And at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pray for everyone that, I mean, I can pray for, for healing and whatever else. 1930, 30s, I don't know what year it was exactly. Do you know, Joyce, was there a year in that research you did? 1931. You can, you can research this on the internet for Shining One Revival or East Central African Revival. But God visited this uh, small community in northern Rwanda and the people started shining. And that Shining One Revival swept all over East Central Africa the tribal people in eastern, what used to be Zaire, about 400,000 people in the tribe that today, all these years later, are 95% prophetic and they live to well over 100, which is not normal for Africans. I ministered a month ago in a church in Maine with a pastor that is one of those tribal people and we were just sharing some of the same war stories as it would be. But anyway, this revival spread. And this pastor that was just at his church, his tribe gathered on this mountaintop in what used to be Zaire. 10, 20,000 people would come for like a camp meeting. And they would just praise God couple two three times a year well one time they had a visitation and it was about 1964 65 somewhere around there mid 60s and when God visited them he gave them four prophetic words number one there would be a great war in Zaire and Zaire never had war the largest country in Africa never had war number two great men of God would go to heaven in flames number three there would be more war and number four a great revival well 
Zaire went to war, 1997. 96, I'm sorry, 1996. At the end of one year, Zaire is no longer Zaire. It's now called the Democratic Republic of the Congo, DRC. And these tribal people were involved in the overthrow, called rebels. And they decided to celebrate the victory. And they called in some of Africa's greatest leaders to come and celebrate the victory, one of them being a dear friend of mine, whose father was the pastor of the Shining One movement back in 1931. My friend David, who we worked with in the refugee camps of Rwanda during the genocide, told me the story about in 1959, his father was still shining as he would come out of a prayer hut. Unfortunately, his father was mutilated in front of him, and he escaped with his siblings through the jungles of Rwanda to grow up in Uganda. And there in Uganda, at the age of 12, he had a personal visitation of Jesus, and Jesus told him his plan for his life. Early 20s, David's in the ministry, in Uganda, Idi Amin is the president of Uganda. Idi Amin hates Christians. He put David on torture tables trying to get David to renounce Christ, and he wouldn't. So Idi Amin put him in a firing squad, left him for dead. David crawled out of the heap of dead bodies to start the ministry, which we were working with. Nineteen nineties when David was on the airplane with all or twenty one other great people, and right where the prophetic word was given in nineteen sixty four or five, that there would be a great war in Zaire, followed by great men of God going to heaven in flames, within a hundred yards of where that word was given the plane crashed and everyone on board went to heaven in flames and they're all buried in a common grave just before the plane crash I talked to David and we made plans to do a pastors conference in Kigali, Rwanda for pastors that were not charismatic but they all had loved ones that were mutilated in the uh, genocide and they were involved in ministry so made that plan two weeks later he's dead I'm thinking how does this happen how does somebody idiot mean can't kill die in a plane crash well we did the conference and right in the middle of the conference God told me right in the middle of a sentence stop and when I stopped long pause, very uncomfortable moment. Holy Spirit fell, baptized 250 pastors in the Holy Ghost. And they spoke in tongues for three hours, glorifying God. In the midst of that, God said to me, go to David's birthplace. I did the next day, never realizing it was the birthplace of their Shining One movement, the, the revival. I'm in the chapel where the revival started. I'm in the prayer hut where his father was shining. And while I'm in the chapel, my friend David's father's name was Isaiah. The partner, his partner to that revival's name was Enoch. I'm in the chapel walking around. Enoch walks in. Not a supernatural experience. Enoch is just very old. But I asked him about this Shining One revival. And he said, David, it wasn't about shining. It was about holiness. He said, uh, there was such a presence of God 
people could not live with sin. And because of that, they would come to the altar every day. And over the course of time, they just started shining. I said, Enoch, would you pray for me for that? I've had great people pray for me, people you would know. But when Enoch prayed for me, something happened. I can't even explain it. I just know I hit the floor, and I got up about a half hour later, and there was a big puddle on the floor. Six months later, I'm back there again. I'm having dinner with a, uh, some people, one of which was a doctor. And she said, David, do you know about the plane crash? I said, no, I don't. She said, well, did you know your friend David and my husband are buried together? I said, no. She said, well, they are with 20 other people, but the truth is they're not buried. They're planted. I said, excuse me, what is that supposed to mean? She said, well, I've met with everybody, every spouse that died. I mean, who had a spouse die on that plane. And everyone tells me the same story. They knew they were going to crash. They knew they were going to die. The prophets came to your friend David and said, do not get on the plane. It's going to crash. And he said, I must do what I'm called to do. And he took his jacket off. Passed the mantle on to his nephew that we now work with. She said, when the plane crashed, I went there trying to identify my husband. No one was recognizable. They were all burned beyond recognition. They're all buried in a common grave. But she said, while I was walking around the, the wreckage, I was attracted to a window that was knocked out of the plane. And when I held the window up, she said, it was like electricity. She said, I don't know what it meant. I said, I do. I said, it's a prophetic picture of a window God's opening in heaven to pour out his spirit. And I'll tell you prophetically, that window's open right here. It's open over the state of Maryland, this whole region. Four prophetic words. Great war in Zaire happened. Great men of God went to heaven in flames, happened. Two weeks later, they went back to war. They're still actually at war. The fourth prophetic word is great revival. That next morning, I woke up with a dream. In the dream, I saw a picture of what looked like Elisha's bones. And I saw a man being thrown down on the bones in this cave, and the man came alive. It was at least a representation of Elijah's bones and a, a man from the Israel army, dead, resurrected. I sat up in this kind of in a trembling state and, and uh, God said to me, there's a resurrection anointing on those bones that will cause spirit to overtake self and I'm sending you there to get it. Long story, I'm making it short, abbreviated story here. There's a, a series back there you might want to get. It's on Sid Roth. It's 10 CDs and spiritual preparation for the end times. And the whole story is there. And the impartation. God sent me there. Got up in the door. On the anniversary of the plane crash, September 12th, I went to the wreckage, went to the gravesite. 40,000 people came to this meeting. I'm the keynote speaker. The, 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 the atmosphere, incredibly euphoric. You can't imagine you know, being in the middle of 40,000 people worshiping God. 
But in the midst of that euphoric atmosphere, on the third day, God gave what he promised, resurrection anointing, that would cause spirit to overtake self. And it was manifest in the natural by peace. And I said, God, I don't get it. How is this resurrection anointing? And he took me to the story of the Shulamite woman that could not have any children. And her son died. She put the son on the prophet's bed, went to her husband. Now the boy is dead, but she says to her husband, all is well. Translated from Shalom. She went to the man of God, same thing, Shalom. And what God said to me, it was the peace in her heart that set the stage for the miracle. And then he put the two anointings together, which I'm going to do here now and pray for you that want it. He took me to Ephesians 5, where it says in verse number 1, be an imitator of God, act like God. And then the next few verses talk about separation from the world have nothing to do with coarse jesting, foolish talk, and all kinds of other little petty sins, as well as some bigger ones. And then he goes on to say, have no fellowship, have no participation with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove, expose. Literally, it's a legal term, convict. Convict people with the light of God. And see, it's that light of God that they're going to be drawn to like bugs in the night light. The light in you is going to attract the unsaved and they're going to want to know what must I do to be saved. Like the lady shining with the tomato. And then verse 14, it says this key verse. Awake thou that sleepest. That is the great awakening. Awake thou that sleepest. Arise from the dead, that's resurrection, and I will cause you to shine. I believe God has put all of this together because he has such a, such a desire to move in such an incredible way right here that he wants you to have everything you're going to need to be established to walk in it. And this isn't about me, I'm just a carrier. But what I'd like to do is pray for this impartation for people that would like it. And uh, at the same time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray for healing. Actually, I'm gonna pray for healing first. And then I'm gonna invite all those up that want to receive the impartation. And this hits people differently. And you know, it may hit you like it hit me. You may be on your face for a half hour. I don't know how that works with the church. Pastor can tell you that. But if, if you're up into it, God's going to do something significant. So, Pastor, are you going to receive a special offering today? For, or, or is, it, is that part of the picture? I just want to know if I need to pause for an offering or doing honorarium or okay okay so here's what we're going to do I'm going to pray first for healing so I'd like you all to stand because of the hour we don't have time to do healing lines and then do impartation lines God is able to touch all of you at one time quite easily So what do you need God to do? The brother came up here. I simply said, say goodbye, pain. It's that simple. Dad can fix anything. So what do you need God to do? What kind of healing do you need? What kind of miracle do you need? The power of God is present to heal. The power of God is present to make whole. And I'm going to pray here in just a moment. And I'm going to believe God is going to touch you right where you're standing.
Father, now in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the gifts of healing. Thank you for the workings of miracles. Thank you for the power of your spirit. Thank you, Father God, for your ability to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all we could ask, think, or imagine. That's it. That's the anointing. Just receive right now. Just receive whatever kind of healing you need, whatever kind of miracle you need, whatever kind of supernatural touch you need, the power of God is here. Father God, in Jesus' name, I release the anointing. I release the healing. I release your power. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That's it. That's it. Someone's getting healing in your back. I can feel. Someone else is getting healing in your chest area. Bronchial thing is being healed. So fibromyalgia just came to me. Father God, I thank you for the healing of fibromyalgia. Diabetes. Father, we just curse diabetes. Curse arthritis. Curse respiratory problems. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just come against the aches and the pains and the strains and the skeleton structure. Father God, I just thank you for healing, anointing to go from the head to the toe, every bone, every joint. Oh, someone, as I said, <laughs> some joint, someone just got a healing in your knee. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Every joint, knees, ankles, elbows, hips, shoulders, wrists. Father God, I thank you. Your healing power made manifest. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Someone's really getting a, it's more of a deliverance from stress, just feeling overwhelmed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, God's going to continue to be healing, but I want to be sensitive to the hour. And here's what I'm going to do.